This two-story house is about 50 years old and it sits on a combination basement and crawl space. The two-thirds of it are under a basement. You can see going up to about that edge of the garage. Um, all of that to the edge of the house, the far side of the house there, are underneath the basement. And that front third, this front section, is sitting underneath the crawl space. Over that 50-year period, the crawl space settled uh, primarily due to poor water management and it settled down between an inch and a half and two inches. So we wanted to lift that up while the uh, facade of the house has been removed. We wouldn't want to raise it if it was already sited since we've taken off the facade. We can raise it and then put a new facade back on and it will be straight and level. Another thing that should be mentioned is that it didn't settle uniformly left to right. That far right side settled about the two inches and the left side was about an inch and a half. So in order to fully support that front section, I uh, tried to cut a hole in the foundation block uh, right as close to the edge of the wall as possible. And I cut that hole about four inches wide. You can see it closely here. <clears throat> the block is normally about eight inches tall, so it's a four by eight approximately and a little bit larger to get a very large I-beam uh, into that hole. So the I-beam then spans the entire distance and most importantly it supports those outer walls as well. So the I-beam goes all the way across. It's within about a foot of the very edge of the wall. It's able to support all of the joists which run perpendicular to the I-beam and then I set up five jack locations and support locations um, underneath that I-beam along the distance, equally spaced. Uh, the outer ones are as close to the edge as you can get. You want to have the minimum amount of cantilever, the distance from your jack to the, the weight point, as possible. So I'm going to show that crawl space in just a few minutes. This is what it looks like from the outside. All right, here we are looking from within the crawl space. I should say up front that this was a very long and dirty job, but there was so little information online that I thought I would provide any help that I could for anyone else trying to do this type of project. All right, more on the details. The first thing I did was sister up additional joists to the outer wall. Normally there's just a single joist, just like these on the outer wall. Uh, I put a new one that spans the distance and goes back to the next supporting wall. This is then the edge of the crawl space going into the basement area. All right, so in order to do that, I had to move some things around. There's, you'll notice there, um, the, the ductwork. I had to replace a significant portion of it that would have been in the way of this beam. I just used um, flexible insulated ductwork and extended on from whatever position I could get back to in order to make it easy enough to get uh, get that beam in there. Now for the actual jack locations, I mentioned there are five. You'll need to determine based on the weight, you know, your estimated weight for the structure, how many you need and how far apart they should be. I don't make any guarantees for this method, but it's worked very well for me. Um, what I did, and I saw some other commercial groups doing this online, I dug out uh, an area, kind of a new foundation for each one of these posts, and filled it with road pack. It's basically just uh, crushed stone, and the stuff that I used had been filtered so that it's just the stone and no, no small aggregate, so that's what I would recommend. Some people are even using this for their own foundations, that they're pouring that and then putting block, maybe a layer of concrete to level everything out and then putting block on top of that. Uh, it provides some drainage ability. Um, so there's crushed stone, there is no poured concrete for each one of those foundations. And then a foundation block that are often used for, uh, I think, porches and things have been placed on top and all of that gets tamped down in the process. Now, I'm using screw jacks, and these are the largest, or the heaviest duty screw jack uh, here. I purchased these from Menards, I think it's the Big Joe 
something like that um, screw jack. But those are much too big. They're you know, four foot eight is the smallest that they'll come in, and that's unacceptably tall. I would have had to make a really deep hole, and it just wouldn't have made any sense. You can buy very small jacks online as a specialty item, but they're very expensive, something like $160 each plus significant shipping costs. Uh, I didn't want to do that with five jacks, so I custom cut these. I just used a, a grinder with a metal blade on it and tried to make sure that my cut was as close to level as possible because it's going to be sitting on one of those edges. I mentioned that I'm using screw jacks as the main jacks for this process. I do have two hydraulic jacks that are kind of sistered up next to the other ones. And I use those to do the actual lifting, to do the hard lifting work. Um, otherwise it's just too much force you need to put on the screw jack. It's just physically very difficult to do. Um, but if you use the hydraulic jacks, you can jack a little bit at a time and then readjust the screw jack to make sure that it's always tight and providing support, um, and then keep going, and you can do it uh, in sections together, just as necessary. Uh, there's a couple ways to make sure that you're getting close to staying level. Um, I have a, a small handheld laser level that's helped out a little bit. One of the most effective methods that I've found is just to take the longest level that you have up to the floors above. We have wood floors that makes it particularly easy. If you take that to different locations, and measure, you know, set it at level, and measure how much uh, you have on the far side to that needs to be raised up. So say it's uh, sitting on the ground on one end and raised up a quarter of an inch on the other. You can take that distance and you know, with some simple math determine if it's a two foot level and it's 13 feet altogether, and you've got a quarter inch, you need to multiply it up by a little bit uh, over six. And so you'd, you'd be able to figure out how much more you need to go uh, on the far left side and the middle and the far right side. And that's been a good rule of thumb, a good way to find out about how close I am. All homes shift a little bit, so it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. We're trying to get as close as we can. I'd like to report, um, at this point the house is almost exactly level, within a quarter of an inch using this process. And again, it's a large chunk two-story house, so it's worked very well for us. No guarantees or anything for anybody else, but I want to share the method. Uh, that's just about it. Go ahead and leave me any questions. This has been one of the more complicated kind of engineering challenges that we've done on this house. So happy to share it and hope that it's useful for other people. I'm sure there's lots of details that I've forgotten to add. Uh, that'll be it. I hope it's helpful. Thanks. I should mention one more thing. Uh, before starting this project, I got a couple quotes from different contractors to do the same work. Uh, the estimates came in anywhere from $11,000 to $21,000. The $11,000 estimate would never actually get back with me to confirm that they would do the work and basically stopped communicating. Uh, I was able to do this work for about six to $700. Almost half of that was in the large I-beam. I think it was around 350 uh, the jacks I was able to get on sale for about $50 each. Um, so on the order of $700, a significant savings, but an enormous amount of work and some risk was involved, just for general numbers and knowledge for people. Thanks.